In writing this book, I set myself a question. How are the mechanisms behind urban inequalities, material deprivation, marginality, and social suffering perpetuated and made invisible? So I like to see my book as an attempt to expose the rise and spread of what I call a vested interest urbanism, an attempt to critique the subservience of quite a lot of urban research to the concerns, categories and moods of policy and opinion makers. My talk today is effectively chapter four uh, of this book on the epic and increasingly global struggle for rent control in the context of mainstream urbanists warning us that it's a terrible disaster. But I'm also going to throw in a few extra things that are not in the book as I try and keep track of what is a very fast moving debate. I'm going to talk about Berlin uh, towards the end of this, uh, this lecture. I deploy the concept of agnotology all the way through the book in order to analyze vested interest urbanism. Scholarship uh, has traditionally and justifiably been concerned with epistemology or the production of knowledge. But we live in a world where people elected to the highest positions of public office routinely lie uh, and become even more popular the more that they lie. That's certainly the case in England right now. So it seems necessary to shift questions away from what people know about the society in which they live towards questions about what people do not know and why not. Uh, these questions are just as important, usually far more scandalous and remarkably under theorized. And, they require, I think, a rejection uh, of appeals to epistemology and instead an analytic focus on intentional ignorance production, which is what agnotology is. Uh, I've been using this concept, by the way, for quite a long time, and if anyone's heard me speak over the last five years, I apologize if this is repetitive, but um, agnotology was coined by the historian of science, Robert Proctor, and refers to the study of the intentional production of ignorance. And it was while investigating the tobacco industry's efforts to manufacture doubt about the health hazards of smoking that Proctor began to see the scientific and political urgency in researching how ignorance is made, maintained, and manipulated by powerful institutions to suit their own agendas. As he discovered, the industry went to great lengths to give the impression that the cancer risks of smoking were still an open question, even when the clinical evidence was overwhelming. Numerous tactics were deployed by the tobacco industry to divert attention from the causal link between smoking and cancer, such as the production of deceitful press releases, the publication of nobody knows the answers white papers, and the generous funding of decoy or red herring research that would seem to be addressing tobacco and health, but actually doing nothing of the sort. And the tobacco industry actually produced research about everything except tobacco hazards to exploit public uncertainty. And the very fact of research being funded allowed the industry to say that it was addressing the problem. Now, there's a couple of books um, that I have taken that have taken up the challenge of agnotology in what I think are quite brilliant ways. On the left there, um, in his blistering critique of the economics profession in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crash, Philip Mirowski argues that one of the major ambitions of politicians, economists, journalists, and pundits is, who embrace a neoliberal view of the world is to plant doubt and ignorance among the populace. And, uh, as he says, and I quote, think of the documented existence of climate change denial and then simply shift it over to economics. More recently, the sociologist Lindsay McGooey has uh, written a beautiful book, which I thoroughly recommend if you're interested in um, the production of ignorance. It's called The Unknowers, there's the cover. And she used the phrase strategic ignorance in reference to situations where various institutions create or magnify unknowns in an offensive rather than a defensive way to generate support for future political initiatives rather than to simply avoid liability for past mistakes. Uh, so these two books, uh, I just found them so inspiring and these scholars, everything I read by them is always so uh, urgent and compelling and exciting. And so I wondered what I could do if I brought agnotology to urban geography. So I started to study the techniques and strategies of institutions such as think tanks, philanthropic foundations, even funding councils, certain university research centers to try and uncover how and why certain questions are kept off the urban agenda while others remain firmly on it. For a, about a decade now, I've been fascinated and disturbed by the huge influence of right-wing think tanks in shaping public policies in the UK. 
if a senior politician gives a high profile speech, it tends to be the case that the ideas have already been aired in a think tank publication not long before. In the process of tracing their huge influence, I've read far, far too many think tank publications, especially on housing. Um, you could argue that I need to get out more, uh, and you'd certainly be correct. Uh, but it seems pretty important, I think, to understand how these institutions operate. So that's why I set myself that you know, fairly exhausting task and fairly soul destroying task of reading through all this think tank stuff. Now, the key techniques of those in think tanks producing, producing ignorance include the concoction of a falsely balanced debate in which there should always be two sides to every story and pumping excess noise into the public discussion as ubiquity, ubiquity helps pave the way for inevitability. But in particular, I've developed a, um, a strange fascination in what really, really upsets the economists working for these think tanks. And by the way, the people working for these think tanks, these economists, they're, they're usually white men uh, with Oxbridge degrees in economics and or politics. It's quite astounding uh, just how many of the people have got uh, these Oxbridge uh, degrees when they're writing these think tanks uh, and employed by these think tanks. And when I say the things that upsets them, what I'm talking about are the things that result in basically tantrums and rent control is really high up the list, probably at the top. Um, in 2015, I got involved in the living rent campaign I mentioned at the start. And when I started making uh, some noises about the necessity and urgency of rent controls, two economists working for the Institute of Economic Affairs, which I'll tell you about in a moment, they, they went nuts on me uh, on Twitter, and it was totally fascinating. They just would not engage in any kind of debate at all over the subject. It became a full-on frontal attack on the discipline of geography. Um, and I, I was just, it was fascinating to me, and I tried to engage them. I was like, well, tell me why I'm wrong. Tell me, explain to me why you feel that what I've said about rent control is not what you think is the right. Thing. And it was no, it was just attack. And then I just got called a Marxist, a communist, and all this. It was just extraordinary to see the way that they don't debate uh, about these issues. Now, the Institute of Economic Affairs is, in fact, a pivotal institution in the history of neoliberalism in the UK. It was founded in 1957 by Anthony Fisher, uh, an ex military pilot and a wealthy chicken farmer, uh, and a personal friend of Friedrich Hayek. And it went on to have a massive influence in the rise of Margaret Thatcher, and it informed many of her most significant policies. In 1972, the Institute of Economic Affairs published an assault against state intervention in housing markets entitled Verdict on Rent Control. You can find this online very easily. And it includes essays by none other than Hayek himself and numerous other giants of neoclassical economics, including Milton Friedman, Many of the contributors to the pamphlet were part of the original Mont Pelerin Society, the birthplace of the neoliberal creed. In the introduction, the reader is left in no doubt uh, as to the tenor of what follows. And there is a quote there from the introduction. These essays should serve as a warning to economists, so, uh, sociologists, and social workers who think that the best way of helping people with low incomes is to equip them with cheap housing at rents fixed by government, a solution, in quotes, that exacts a savage price to be paid by future generations. So uh, that's kind of in no uncertain terms, isn't it? Um, as I started reading more about rent control, I quickly discovered that it's not just economists on the right who argue against it. In 1965, the Nobel Prize winning Swedish welfare economist Gunnar Murdahl said rent control has in certain Western countries constituted maybe the worst example of poor planning by governments lacking courage and vision. In possibly the most uh, famous tirade against rent control of all time, the long term chair of the Nobel Prize for Economics Committee, Assel Lindbeck, remarked in 1971 that rent control appears to be the most efficient technique presently known to destroy a city except for bombing. Um, Lindbeck, by the way, was no lefty, um, but he did believe in something called a welfare state. So to call him a right wing economist would be unfair. Uh, centrist, I think, would be more accurate. But this ridiculous exaggeration has in multiple international contexts repeatedly shut off any useful debate about rent control before it even gets started. And it's led to numerous imitations and extensions even, such as this one. Rent control is worse than bombing. 
The terms mainstream economists use to condemn rent control are always the strongest possible terms. Many of these economists are very well known and very well read public intellectuals. Another one who condemned rent control in strong terms, by the way, was Paul Krugman in a column for the New York Times about 15 years ago. Um, when they condemn rent control, their large audiences listen to them and they sometimes believe them. So underpinning all arguments against rent control, conservative and liberal, is the ongoing battle over the commodity nature of housing and its role in our economic and social system. Just hearing those words, rent control, is deeply unsettling, I have found, to anyone who can't cope with the idea of price controls, to anyone who believes in so-called free and competitive market economies and in the sanctity of private property rights and in the idea that nobody should be prevented from making as much money as they can from housing. Um, I've actually been in quite a few professional settings, I can remember, where mentioning rent control generates the same kind of reaction as insulting somebody. Um, and the near hysterical reactions of the most right-wing economists to rent control are actually quite fascinating if you give them some wider context. So in most countries, there are laws protecting the rights of shareholders from the consequences when they invest in companies that do illegal things or even support awful or genocidal regimes. And right-wing economists don't often talk about those laws. But when rent control is put forward as a tiny, tiny law protecting the rights of people to have somewhere to live, those same economists just go completely berserk. Uh, and I found these kinds of differences very, very interesting to follow as I've been doing this, uh, the research for the book that I um, is coming out in September. Now, strong negative reactions to rent control are not purely ideological. They are also driven by the fact that few economists ever get past the, the destructive consequences of what are today referred to as first generation rent controls, which is a complete long term freeze on nominal rent significantly below the market level. Um, European countries imposed these during World War I, and they really took off as a policy in multiple international contexts during or just after World War II in order to cope with the massive relocations of labour during that time and to ensure affordable housing for returning military personnel. In European contexts, housing reconstruction after World War II was slow due to extensive damage and especially war-ravaged economies, so rent controls remained in place often with very little adjustment from wartime levels of rent. Many governments maintain those controls as a facade to hide the lack of an effective housing program. The consequences for many urban housing markets were very damaging. Landlords had chronically insufficient income uh, for necessary maintenance expenditure, and that led to large scale physical, physical decay and abandonment. There were serious mismatches between housing units and housing tenants and therefore reductions in availability to the point of saturation. And rent freezes encouraged highly exploitative residual informal and illegal markets in housing provision. There's a tremendous book detailing all this uh, that came out a couple of years ago now called Paradoxes of Segregation, written by the very brilliant Sonia Abachi. And she painstakingly documented these processes from roughly the late 1940s to the mid 1980s in southern European contexts of Spain, Italy, Greece, and especially Portugal. And evidence of the negative effects of first generation rent controls is actually pretty substantial, far beyond Europe and North America, such as India, Mexico, Egypt, and South Africa, just to name a few examples of where these first generation rent controls have been very damaging. So when mainstream economists, across the political spectrum condemn rent controls, it's first generation long-term rent freezes that they have in mind. And among the left, no scholars or housing justice activists anywhere are calling for them as far as I'm aware. I've not seen a campaign that says we need these kinds of rent controls. But um, when you hear people condemn them, it's usually these kinds of first generation rent controls that people are thinking of. There's another kind though, second generation rent controls considerably different, much more varied, and still quite remarkably under-researched. They protect tenants from excessive rent increases by creating a set of conditions for any increases, usually depending on housing quality, while ensuring that landlords will receive a, what's called a reasonable return on their investment. Now, different landlords will have a different version of what's reasonable, uh, but that is a, a definition of what these second generation rent controls are all about. So it's ensuring that the landlord 
doesn't lose out and it's ensuring that the tenant is protected. That's the main goal with a second generation form of rent control. They are so varied that it is hard to generalize about them, so different from their predecessors that actually they should be evaluated largely independently of the experience with first generation rent controls. But unfortunately that evaluation work, and this is probably why there's not a huge amount of literature on it, um, it's very difficult to do because of disentangling the effects of rent controls from numerous other policies that shape local housing markets. Uh, I'm thinking of things like the state of the local and macro economy, government housing and taxation policies, what kind of welfare regime, land values, land ownership, real estate transactions, there's many things that affect a housing market. So it's very difficult um, to disentangle second generation rent controls from other things which may determine the cost of housing. But after reading as much as I could find about second generation rent controls from a variety of sources, there is actually pretty compelling evidence from where they've been studied, multiple international contexts, that rent controls of this kind not only make housing more affordable, but they restrict evictions, either those that happen through rent increases or those that happen through conversions or um, renovations. Now, rent control has become a crucial battleground in struggles for housing justice in many cities across the globe. Because of all kinds of campaigns for rent control, there are numerous attempts by people frightened by rent controls to derail those campaigns by telling us what a massive disaster uh, rent controls will be. And in reading what they have to say, I have, I've identified three myths or three deliberately engineered falsehoods is probably a better description. Uh, and this is that rent controls will threaten the quality, the supply and the efficiency of a housing sector anywhere at any time. And I'm gonna deal with these quickly in turn uh, to show you what I mean by myths or deliberately engineered falsehoods. The quality myth is the first one. What is this myth? Rent controls would have negative consequences on the overall standard of rental units on the market. And the specter of first generation rent controls dominates this argument. If a landlord cannot charge the, a tenant the rent that they would like to charge in order to make a profit, they will have insufficient funds for expenditure on property maintenance. Today, the most obvious flaw with such an argument is that housing quality within the private rental market in so many contexts is already atrocious. In the UK, it is the absolute worst of all tenures with the most sophisticated surveys of poverty available showing that one in three tenants in the private rented sector live in structurally inadequate housing. Also, in the decades before post World War I state intervention in housing, when the vast majority of the UK population were privately renting, standards were far worse. The historical record of laissez-faire liberalism on housing standards is simply terrible. Dismal conditions, overcrowding was commonplace in British cities, especially in tenements. So those arguing that rent controls of any kind will always and everywhere worsen housing quality can't have it both ways. Whenever there has been little or no regulation at all, rental housing quality has been truly appalling. Now, of course, any consideration of the quality of a housing sector must, of course, have the question of safety at its core. And the consequences of steady and long term deregulation and privatisation of various forms of rental housing in the UK, where private and social landlords cut corners wherever they can to minimise expenditure and maximise income. Well, this has had very dangerous implications for tenants. And we saw with the Grenfell Tower fire in London a few years ago what happens when deregulation goes too far. So it's misleading to claim that introducing even second generation rent regulation would make that quality and safety problem even worse. And this is abundantly clear in the case of the Netherlands, where until recently the amount a landlord was allowed to increase rent on an annual basis was conditional upon the standard of the property that they are leasing. And the result is a rental housing stock in the Netherlands in way better shape than countries that have no rent regulation. The second myth is perhaps the most dominant one of all, and that concerns the question of supply. Um, again, via appeals to the experience of first generation rent controls, the argument goes that if any rent controls were introduced, there would be no incentive for anyone to become a landlord. Existing landlords would withdraw their properties from the market and developers would not build any new rental housing. 
The result, therefore, would be a restriction in the supply of new housing for rent, which would lead to any existing housing crisis getting worse and prices going up further due to demand dwarfing supply. This is effectively the supply and demand cocoon of neoclassical economics writ large and dubious logic on several levels. The logic implies that any curtailing of the profits to be made from a sector will simply stop people investing in it. This is akin to believing that a minimum wage means companies stop employing people, that sales tax means nobody sells anything anymore, and that fuel tax means nobody drives. So it's an argument based on the belief that people will only ever seek to make money in conditions of totally unhampered profitability, a fantasy of a perfectly competitive market where landlords compete to produce homogenous housing units where there are no externalities at all, where every actor possesses perfect information. But if landlords are told that they cannot by law charge a tenant whatever they like without meeting certain conditions, it is highly unlikely that they are all going to sell up suddenly and get out of the sector. And there's actually no robust evidence from anywhere to demonstrate that this happens. In fact, there was a wonderful study I came across by a sociologist called Loïc Bonneval on 64 buildings under rent control in central Lyon in France. And he found no evidence that the profitability of real estate was affected by rent control over a period of 50 years. Um, so in tight rental markets, where developers and landlords have market power, rent controls have actually increased supply. If developers can't generate extra profit through rent increases, that actually creates strong incentives to build more affordable units on a large scale or for landlords to subdivide larger rental units. And evidence from the state of New Jersey um, does indeed suggest that to be the case. Speaking of New Jersey, at the end of uh, 2019, an economist uh, called J.W. Mason testified before Jersey City Council on rent control as part of the legal review that was underway. And he said this, and I thought it was especially powerful, I quote, what, re what rent control is limiting are the rent, increase that are rent increases that are not the result of anything the landlord has done. The rent increases that result from the increased desirability of a particular area or of a broader regional shortage of housing relative to demand. There is no reason that limiting these windfall gains should affect the supply of housing. In a setting where the supply of new housing is already limited by other factors, rent regulation will have little or no additional effect on housing supply. Instead, it will simply reduce the monopoly profits enjoyed by owners of existing housing. And Mason knows what he's talking about because he's probably studied rent control across the United States the most. And you know, he's seen where it's worked well and seen when it hasn't worked so well. And that was his conclusion when he testified before Jersey City Council. But let's also consider the opposite end of the supply argument. If you believe the mainstream economists, you might assume that if strict long-term rent controls end, that would mean that supply would increase dramatically. But in her book that I mentioned earlier, Sonia Abachi's book, Paradoxes of Segregation, what she demonstrated was that ending entrenched first generation rent controls in cities in Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Greece that did not open the floodgates for the supply of adequate and affordable housing. By contrast, it facilitated something pretty predictable, gentrification, displacement and forced evictions of low income and other vulnerable tenants. And also deregulation and corresponding liberalization of the housing market meant that in all of the cities that she studied in Southern Europe, rents escalated not just in the upgraded districts, but across the whole municipal area, outpricing low income tenants uh, from most municipal districts. So that was a consequence for housing supply when rent controls were lifted. Also, there have been several studies that have looked at the effects of the abolition of rent control in Massachusetts in the 1990s and found that it had little effect on the construction of new housing. Um, there's also somebody, I think, at uh, Virginia Tech called Ben Teresa, and he's explained how the gradual relaxation of rent stabilization laws in New York City has not led to the construction of affordable housing, far from it. It's rather enabled private equity firms and asset managers to exploit increases in potential rents and engage in value extraction practices, leading to vast profits from once regulated housing stock. Perhaps a simple illustration of how skewed the entire debate is will suffice. Those who argue against rent control repeatedly and inaccurately claim that it always drives up rents for other tenants 
who are unprotected by it. Tellingly, that argument is always framed against rent control, not against unregulated landlords. So it's interesting to see what kind of the terms of the debate and what people are thinking of when they're trying to put forward their particular version of how a housing market should be. Finally, we come to the efficiency myth. <clears throat> Excuse me. For mainstream economists, something is inefficient if it artificially interferes with the natural operation of the price mechanism of the market. Rent controls are repeatedly condemned as forms of price fixing that will have negative consequences in terms of distorting market values and encouraging the problem of sitting tenants, that's the language which is used, uh, who will do all of these things, A, B and C are on this slide here, sitting tenants. Um, in fact, in economics textbooks, you can often find cartoons of sitting tenants, which are quite disturbing, uh, like in a sort of basic introduction to economics, right? It's never about, you know, what, what are the circumstances that tenants in? It's just they're in the way of somebody making profit. Um, the problem with these appeals to rent controls being inefficient are first the assumption that low income households have the freedom to rationally choose where they want to live without any kind of structural constraints in their lives. And second, the way that inefficiency is actually skewed to the interests of economist models and ultimately landlords. If we consider housing as a question of social justice, a human need, then inefficiency arguments, uh, I think, are to be treated with caution. So there's a wonderful book that came out about three or four years ago now called In Defense of Housing by David Madden and Peter Marcus. And they point out uh, something, again, quite powerful, and I'm just going to quote from it. One person's inefficiency is another person's home. From the perspective of a tenant facing displacement from their longtime home, it is the system of commodified residential development that is inefficient, not to mention cruel and destructive. The language of efficiency actually reflects the very different worlds between tenured economists working in elite universities or economists working in well-funded think tanks and the lives of low-income tenants struggling to feed their families on very low incomes, or even having to make the choice between paying rent or eating. Real efficiency, um, it surely is not achieved when rental housing costs have reached around 50% of household incomes, which is a common place now uh, in the UK among people living in poverty. When households have so little money to spend on other necessities, when the effects of housing insecurity place pressures on other sectors, such as healthcare provision, the case of the UK is especially inefficient. The state hemorrhages 35 billion pounds a year on payments to private sector landlords so that people eligible for universal credit housing costs can actually afford to pay rent. So underpinning this three pronged mythology of quality, supply and efficiency, there's a long and seemingly unending debate on what leads to high housing costs. For neoclassical economists, conservative think tanks, developers, and anyone in some way connected to the housing industry, the high cost of housing is due to a simple imbalance vis-a-vis -vis supply and demand. Too many people, too few homes. In this register, the remedy for the imbalance is equally simple. Uh, you basically remove any barriers that prevent developers building as much housing as possible. For example, not long ago, uh, the mainstream economist Ed Glazer famously used a New York Times op-ed to call for complete deregulation. And he said, the best way to make cities more affordable is to unleash the cranes. To do so, end the dizzying array of land use regulations in most cities that increase cost. And this is what uh, free market think tanks in, in the UK say time and time again in reports that actually end up as government white papers. This is just profoundly misleading. Rory Hearn has actually demonstrated this so well. House prices are not determined by supply and demand because you do not have a choice about needing to be housed. Allow an unregulated market to develop when social housing is also being cut and there is no choice not to buy what is on offer other than sleeping on the streets. Prices will go sky high. Um, Danny Dawling's book on housing is very good in that he says, in the UK, we've never had more housing than we have right now in our history. Uh, but it's just shared out more unequally than ever before. The other thing is that supply and demand analyses are wholly inadequate in explaining the problems of affordable housing because of the significant matter of land value and especially land ownership. In the UK, land value now constitutes nearly three quarters of the cost of a house. Approximately 70% of the land in the UK is owned by 0.66% of the population. 
just 6,000 or so landowners, large institutions, aristocrats and the royal family, for example, own about 40 million acres of land or two thirds of the UK. Brett Christophers has demonstrated that if you cram the UK population onto a small percentage of land, which is what's happened, and, then, and if you are hoarding and speculating on the urban land that is available, that creates an artificial land shortage that pushes up land values. And in fact, land now constitutes 51% of the UK's entire net worth, almost double the percentage in Germany. Um, and that in turn makes house prices astronomically high and ever more divorced from stagnant wages. <coughs> Excuse me. Rent control will not by itself end what we refer to these days as the financialization of housing. And contrary to what right wing think tanks would have you believe, um, it's not an anti capitalist policy either. But what it does do is it reduces evictions, and there's substantial evidence uh, from the studies which have emerged in places where they've been done that rent controls of the second generation variety brings down rents. And when acting in tandem with other progressive policies that are geared towards tenants and the use values of homes and land, not the exchange values preferred by landlords in the housing industry, what rent controls do is make a serious dent in the high cost of housing more broadly. Rent controls work best when they're paired with tenant security measures, when they're implemented without any loopholes and um, implemented without any kind of free for all when units under control become vacant for any reason what is usually termed vacancy decontrol. So rent control is best seen, I think, as just one policy among many that can be implemented in order to shift the focus away um, from assets, profit and investments and towards community, home, family and shelter. With this in mind, I want to highlight a wonderful report that I came across. Uh, it was published in 2019, produced by Policy Link, the Center for Popular Democracy and the Right to the City Alliance, and it's entitled Our Homes, Our Future, How Rent Control Can Build Healthy, Stable Communities. And what this report did was pull together a remarkable range of qualitative and quantitative evidence from across the US to present a pretty compelling case for rent controls of the second generation variety. And four points in particular were made. First, that rent controls increase housing stability uh, and affordability for current tenants. They stabilize communities under threat from gentrification. Second, they are unrivaled in their speed and scale. Third, they're cost effective relative to other housing policies. And fourth, they protect low income households that are disproportionately seniors, people of color, women with young children and the sick and disabled. It's difficult to imagine a more convincing call for rent control as what they call a cornerstone of housing justice, especially as the report relied first and foremost on the expertise of people working with tenant organizations in order to promote rent control programs where tenants actually play a central role in their design and their implementation. Um, going back to agnotology, so I'm going to finish off in a minute. I've heard quite a few people argue when I've talked about agnotology in the past that there's no such thing as the intentional production of ignorance. All that exists are people with different worldviews, interests and opinions, and they people of different political stripes simply argue and defend their beliefs with passion. I think that's wide of the mark when thinking about rent control, especially when there's a vast body of all kinds uh, of evidence that's wildly at odds with what's being stated when the social realities of poverty and inequality uh, expose the failures of economic deregulation, the technocrats of neoliberal reason, what happens, they just become noisier and noisier and more zealous in their relentless mission to inject doubt into the conversation and ultimately make their audiences believe that government interference in the workings of the free market is damaging society. With this in mind, I want to tell you something about what happened in Berlin very recently. So Berlin's rent cap or Mietendeckel was part of a new law passed it by the city in January 2020. Uh, the cap prevented owners of flats built before 2014 charging more than what had been agreed in June 2019. New builds were exempt from this. It also stipulated that any rents that were 20% in excess of acceptable levels should be reduced, varying according to location and quality. Landlords who did not comply with the new law faced heavy fines. The policy was to be in place for five years, following which rent increases would be limited to 1.3% per year in line with inflation. The product of years of organizing by housing movements and left-wing parties in the city, the Mietendeckel was very popular 
with Berlin's tenants, unsurprisingly, and they make up three quarters of the city's households. Uh, it meant that hundreds of thousands of households were eligible for significantly lower rent, which had been skyrocketing in recent years. And it also meant that it was no longer possible for speculators to buy buildings for the sole purpose of rent gouging. But of course, this rent cap, this meat and decal, was hated by landlords, hated by real estate investors and members of Germany's conservative political parties. In March, Bloomberg Opinion, a longtime mouthpiece for the free market approach to housing, they ran a piece by Andreas Kluth with this headline, Berlin's rent controls are proving to be a disaster. And here's what he said, as expected, Rents in Berlin's regulated market plummeted in relative terms, and rents in the unre uh, unregulated market simultaneously started rising faster. Real estate loses its value if future cash flows to landlords are capped. There was an, also an acceleration of apartments going up for sale as landlords tried to cash out of their now less profitable investments. <laughs> so rent control, um, it's doing what economists say it doesn't. It's reducing rents and increasing the supply of apartments. Well, fantastic, right? Um, but then the conclusion was just so telling and so predictable. The biggest question is whether this episode of left-wing populism has damaged confidence in Berlin's real estate market permanently. If investors fear that local property rights will be put at risk in every election, they might stop building houses in the city at all. What you see as the biggest question, of course, depends on where your interests lie. Um, in 1934, the great economist of industrial location, August Losch, he rather pompously stated that if my economic models do not conform to reality, then it is reality that is wrong. And that seems to be exactly the kind of stubbornness to, to dislodge when we think about who dominates the conversation on rent control. Anyway, a lawsuit against the Meet and Dekel was filed by 284 parliamentary members of centre-right parties, and then there was a much anticipated ruling last month. Germany's constitutional court ruled that the Meet and Dekel was unconstitutional and therefore null and void. And the rent freeze has already been lifted and increases can now be demanded on existing leases. Landlords are also entitled to demand back payments on pro previously frozen rents. So countless evictions now loom for tenants facing really quite significant rent arrears. Um, David Madden and Alex Vazudevan, they wrote a piece in The Guardian recently, which said that um, the ruling may actually prove to be a pyrrhic victory for the city's landlords and speculators because anger over the nullification of the rent cap is actually fueling support for a campaign for the expropriation and remunicipalization of thousands of units of public housing that have been privatized. So that's an epic battle that's still continuing. Activists have to chip away constantly at the layers of strategic ignorance on rent control all the time, and they have to navigate the concoction by the media of a ridiculous and extreme false choice between savage capitalism on the one hand and old fashioned socialism uh, on the other. I started with Scotland's tenant union living rent and I'm gonna finish with them too. Um, initially, what Living Rent set out to do was accomplish a very simple mission, which was to bring back the word rent control to the political debate, where it had been erased for so long. The campaign began by reaching out to existing organisations, particularly labour unions and student unions, and to the general public, notably through a large number of um, weekend street stalls and online activism. Um, Living Rent also organized marches and public protests about the housing crisis and a major campaigning intention was to push the, the ruling Scottish National Party to be more progressive uh, about housing issues. Within six months of beginning their campaign, Living Rent had affiliations with organizations representing more than a million people in Scotland, from trade unions to students associations to women's organizations to faith and youth groups. And it was able to articulate the intersection of housing precarity with other social problems, how it affects many different marginalized groups in particularly acute ways, especially minority women. Uh, these organizations backed the campaign because rent control quite simply resonated with them all. A common sense solution to an increasingly pressing problem, the high cost of housing dominating people's lives to the point where the most vulnerable are consigned to financial ruin. Within three years of, li of living rent forming, the Scottish government was under such intense pressure that it announced the end of the right of landlords to reclaim their properties from tenants without any reason. Uh, 
So that was a big victory, a security of tenure, um, as indeed was getting the question of rent control on the polit political agenda in Scotland, where it had not been for a very long time. Now, the Scottish Green Party, which does have some influence in parliamentary circles um, in Scotland, they have rent control as their main housing policy. Um, so Living Rent continues to campaign for second generation rent controls that are of the Netherlands variety, linking rent levels to the quality and safety of a home. But it continues to face massive resistance from politicians, not least because over a quarter of Scottish National Party MSPs are private sector landlords themselves. Right. So they have vested, vested interests in maintaining the status quo without rent regulation. Living Rent has lobbied hard and successfully for a moratorium on evictions for the duration of the pandemic. And now the challenge is to continue with the message that safe and affordable housing is a form of health care. Um, and to get legislation passed that recognizes that as such. So the struggle continues for living rent. Um, and um, it's, it's been a privilege to watch them go and to see where they're going next. And they haven't got rent control yet, but they're not gonna give up. Uh, so it's been fascinating as somebody um, who researches these issues to be watching them and seeing where they're going and seeing the kinds of ignorance that they have to navigate as they make their way through the, the quite difficult landscape of uh, housing policy in Scotland. So I'll stop there. I hope I haven't overrun and thank you for your attention and I'll hand back to Phil now.